All right, well, welcome everybody to our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Thanks to today's uh, first session sponsor, GeoComfort Systems have earth-powered HVAC to help you and your clients get to net zero energy target easily and affordably. Several projects we have worked with um, uh, with these systems have achieved the zero energy capable or ILFI zero energy certification using low energy but comfortable HVAC systems provided by GeoComfort. Besides uh, forced air, GeoComfort systems have an all new water to water system that can power your water heater, radiant driveway melt, pool, hot tub, and more, all without additional water heating. Bonus, 30% tax deduction is reapproved by Congress and is retroactive um, for 2017 projects. Uh, make sure you get your system spec'd uh, by the end of this year, 2019, to get that full tax credit, but then tax credits still remain uh, throughout that. Thanks to our session main top tier sponsor, T-Stud. T-Stud is the 2019 Green Builder Media Sustainability Award winner for structural ingenuity. So what is a T-Stud? This T-Stud is a game-changing technology. It solves the number one nemesis of construction industry, how to cost-effectively stop the transfer of outdoor climatic heat or cold from affecting the interior of a structure's ambient room temperature. Plainer terms, a T-Stud is the best piece of lumber available to minimize the outdoor temperature from coming through all the framing members in a wall to negatively affect uh, your client's heating and cooling bills. It's a thermally broken insulated wall stud assembly for use in exterior walls and party walls. It's an engineered building product that uses two lumber members and an internal truss system and a froth in place closed cell phone that has a global warming potential of less than one and is EPA compliant for 2020. The T-Stud provides a 99% complete thermal break through the wall assembly with just one product. The T-Stud raises the bar on six major construction concerns, thermal breaks, structural strength, wind loads, sound transmission, fire safety, mold, termites. It's not complicated. It's quite easy to replace the traditional two by lumber with T-Stud with little no uh, additional training. Plus it can be used as studs, jack studs, king studs, sills, cripples, headers, top and bottom plates, uh, and rebates may be available um, within your state or local utility. All right. So what I want to do now is that with that setup, go into our three wall case studies. Obviously, I'm going to have to hit some of them a little more quickly than others, perhaps. But uh, it's mostly illustrations that I think you'll have the background now to quickly appreciate how these walls go together and how they're supposed to work. Here's what we want to achieve, of course, right? In addition to energy efficiency, comfortable, durable, healthy, resilient, uh, accessible in the marketplace, easy to build, uh, robust for the life of the building, and cost effective. The first wall I'm going to introduce to you is called the extended plate and beam. I think it's gone now under the extended plate wall system. It was developed by the Home Innovation Research Laboratories, formerly the uh, Research Center for the uh, Home Builders Association, uh, Home, uh, Home Builders Association Research Center. Some of you might be familiar with that in its previous life. Anyway, uh, there, there's a great demand to improve energy efficiency beyond our current two by six wall. Uh, there's great concern that the two by six wall, as I had mentioned, has kind of stretched itself a little thin and requires perfect execution, which is hard to achieve today in the marketplace. So there's this demand for better walls. There's a need for more robust walls. There's need to move insulation to the outside to provide this robustness uh, from condensation or to maintain drying potential, essentially what this is trying to do. But yet there's this concern about cost and complexity and concerned by the industry of how to do it. And so there's a need for a wall that they will recognize and can quickly move in the right direction. And that's what this is all about. Essentially, if you will, these are walls that are still being built on the platform, if you will, platform framed. You're gonna build a two by six wall. However, you're gonna use two by four studs. So the top plate might be two by six, bottom plate might be two by six. Your framing around your window opening may be two by six, although it could be two by four. Then you're gonna put two by fours in as you're into your framing while it's laying there on the ground. Then you'll insert two inches of foam. Now you have essentially uh, flushed out the thickness of your studs with your uh, plates. And then you'll bring in your sheathing material of choice. You'll put the sheathing on with a special, frame, uh, special uh, fastening schedule. And now you have a wall that has essentially, for the most part, 95% of the wall has exterior foam insulation. Uh, and yet the builder, when they tip the wall up, it looks exactly like every other wall they've done. And they know how to install the window. They know how to install the house wrap. They know how to install the drywall, et cetera. So that's the concept here. You see a view of it uh, from both the inside and the outside. 
essentially this inset two inches of insulation. Now this could be two by six studs with two by eight plates because it's not exactly two inches that requires some uh, modifications, but the two by four, two by six is a really good example here. And it also leads us to the conversation of the ratio of exterior interior insulation is going to be closer together, meaning that wall can work in far more uh, locations climate wise. So uh, I'll have to rush these a little bit, but you can always go back to these slides. Uh, the water controller is their traditional uh, weather resistive barrier, uh, or it could be a treated OSB with, or it could be liquid applied, whatever, just whatever the builders are comfortable with and currently using perhaps. The air control air is a rigid foam in some fashion sealed uh, at the edges, uh, or it could be the WRB taped, again, an exterior uh, air barrier, if you will. There are some challenges with that. We just have to be careful how that's installed to prevent uh, vertical and horizontal movement. Uh, and then your thermal control air is a dual layer, the rigid foam plus whatever you put in the cavity. And again, minimal thermal bridging just at the uh, upper and lower plate, up uh, top and bottom plate. The vapor control strategy is a little trickier. Again, you probably is, is you're thinking of the foam and the warm inside edge of the foam as a vapor control strategy, and that certainly works. Uh, if you get the cavity ratio off, cavity to foam off, you may need to introduce a smart vapor retarder or a craft face vapor retarder on the inside uh, for your colder climates. Uh, I'll just show a couple examples here, and again, I'll have to breeze by them, but uh, again, it talks about the nailing schedule here, and you're nailing your, your sheathing through to your studs, of course, and obviously a heavy nailing schedule at the plates and perimeter. But again, the whole idea here is this exterior OSB is familiar to the builder, allows them to kind of use their traditional techniques for drainage plane, window, and cladding attachment. Suitable for all climate zones, again, as long as you're paying attention to the ratio, and um, 95% free of thermal bridging. Uh, you certainly could use T studs and make this even uh, more robust in that sense. Uh, fairly uh, cost competitive. Uh, it is more expensive because we're using rigid foam, but it's less expensive than trying to do the continuous foam on the outside uh, with additional furring strips, et cetera, and cladding. The next wall system I want to introduce is the hybrid optimum. We call it the optimum wall. Uh, this was named after, you'll see in a second, after a, a student project that became quite uh, popular. Uh, and it basically uses two by four framing. Again, it could be two by six, but I'm gonna use two by four framing for simplicity here. Uh, it's normal standard framing, 16 inch on center. You can double up, triple up, do whatever you want with your other framing. Again, you could use uh, advanced framing, that's better. Uh, you could use T-stud even for your framing, that's better. But the point here is you're going to address your thermal bridging with your exterior con continuous control air, uh, thermal control air. Use your uh, conventional sheathing of choice, and then you're going to basically place an air, water, and vapor control air on that uh, sheathing, integrate it with your windows, and then add exterior insulation, furring, and cladding. So uh, it got its name from a student project that won the 2015 the Department of Energy Race to Zero uh, was a grand award winner called the Impact Home. The student team was called Optimen, and uh, they successfully used this wall in their winning project. And uh, so that's why I gathered the name Optimen. But there's lots of people using this wall in various ways. It's fine. Call it whatever you like. Uh, but the point here is, is they were able then to work with affordable housing uh, providers. They use traditional framing techniques. You know, everything is the same. Same materials, same methods. Uh, obviously these walls would have sheathing on them because that's normally how they frame up and tip up the, the wall framing. But uh, just look how simple and approachable this is. Uh, after that's up, then you basically place your air vapor and water control airs on the building system. Uh, in this case, the wall is actually using a uh, uh, impregnated OSB with a uh, tape seam approach with drainable insulation over that to get the liquid water away. Uh, on the roof, it's actually using a peel and stick membrane with insulation. The wall ratio is 15-15, uh, R15, R15, or 50-50. On the roof, the ratio is 20-30, 19 bat or 21 bat in the uh, top cord of the truss, and R30 continuous insulation above. Both have furring strips on the outside for the cladding and the top furring strip for the over roofing. 
again, uh, with this roof approach, everything's brought indoors. The entire structure is kept warm and dry throughout its life. Uh, and we regain all those cavities uh, for uh, w whether it be uh, ductwork or electrical or other uh, services. Uh, we can obviously play with r roof shapes and forms to uh, add additional uh, space for storage or living or uh, mechanicals, et cetera. And water control air is really simple. It's a peel and stick membrane. Air control, peel and stick membrane, thermal control, uh, split hybrid insulation, and the vapor control basically is also peel and stick membrane. This membrane is a very, very, very low perm membrane, but by how we're locating it and managing the ratio, it is perfectly safe. So again, simple and familiar framing, uh, no interior air sealing is required at this point. You can glue the drywall. You don't have to worry about special electrical boxes and, and an occasional uh, uh, mechanical or utility intrusion into the cavity, et cetera. And again, high R value, superior tightness, very, very robust. And again, the inside cavity can dry to the inside, the outside can dry to the outside. Uh, it can be more expensive. There are obviously some construction details that require some care. For instance, the exterior furring strips have to find the framing. And the window trim adds a little bit of depth and detail there too. All right, I'm gonna finish with uh, our solid panel system. This is a project funded by uh, the Building America, DOE and to develop a new enclosure technology that would be delivered by a single enclosure contractor that's going to try to achieve high performance, a high level of constructability and quality control, and at a very cost effective or cost competitive uh, market rate. Uh, again, won't go through those, but basically the same thing. Can we get better at a lower cost? Uh, can we deliver it through an innovative building delivery system? And uh, will this system optimized system, uh, deliver cost-effective zero energy ready homes, especially for affordable housing. So here's the uh, wall detail. It's essentially two layers of OSB. This is a very dense, uh, high resin content, robust OSB uh, designed basically for uh, uh, industrial purposes or industrial uses. We're using these two panels uh, cross laminated. The exterior panel goes vertical from the sill plate to the top core of the truss, upper tr roof truss. The inside panels lay horizontally going from floor truss to floor truss or floor truss to roof truss. Uh, they're covered by a, a peel and stick membrane, two layers of insulation offset with a furring strip and cladding. It's just that simple. So this is the perfect wall kind of uh, at its highest level. Uh, all the controllers are outboard, structure is 100% in, uh, uh, inboard. The idea here is really to, is driven by, more than anything, quick erection and cost reduction of the structure. If we, if we don't need the cavity for insulation, like we, or, we, or we're concerned about increasing the depth of the cavity so far with so much insulation and all the risk and execution perfection that requires, how about we just eliminate the cavity, go with a different structural system that's very cheap and inexpensive, and put our money into our exterior controller. So that's the point here is, can we reduce the cost of the structure to give us some money to build better, more robust, uh, higher quality controllers? And one technique then is to essentially turn the building enclosure over to a single enclosure contractor that does the entire enclosure, puts up the exterior shell, um, completes that, and all the other trades can be inside working away, uh, doing their normal thing. So now we have one layer of accountability for the entire building enclosure uh, through a single contractor rather than myriads, probably as many as 10 or 12 contractors touching your exterior wall before you're done. So again, techniques very, very straightforward. A peel and stick membrane is what we traditionally have been using. The point here is it's very product uh, uh, friendly. I mean, you could use liquid applied, you could use other materials, you could use the impregnated uh, panels. The point here is get your air, water, and vapor barrier on your structure. Uh, then the thermal control can be anything. And again, we're using continuous R20. It's amazing. We're getting uh, HERS values uh, in the low 40s, now even in high 30s with this kind of level of insulation, which is unheard of. But it's due to the continuity, uh, con you know, the complete continuous insulation and the air tightness that we were able to achieve. And the vapor control, of course, is the peel and stick as well. Again, 
highly impermeable, but in a very, very safe location. There will be condensation on this membrane from the outside in in the summer, but again, we have to use a thermal control material that's not moisture susceptible. But that could be pretty variable. Uh, it could be rigid board, it could be uh, fiber uh, board, it could be a uh, rock wool type uh, product. And here's just some examples of it, and I'm going to go through these quickly again, just so you can see the concept and the scheme. These are our first four houses. I'm going to show you the third house, which is the bottom, or the fourth house, actually, bottom uh, right corner. And uh, here's the house under construction. These control airs start at the basement, uh, in the slab, in fact, across the wall, up the outside of the wall. It's another reason why we like this technique, or the optimum, where the foundation exterior insulation is continuous all the way up. Uh, past the rim joist and on up the building. In this case, all of our insulation is outboard for both the foundation and the wall. Uh, here you see the corners going up. They basically are braced corners, similar to what you see in masonry construction or tilled up panel. Then the uh, ex interior floor can be hung. Uh, the interior panels are put in place. The exterior panels are finished off. The water control, the windows are cut in. The water control air detailing begins. Uh, all the penetrations are airtight, watertight. Uh, the insulation goes on. Uh, you see in the roof the same techniques being followed, uh, multiple layers, thicker layers here, uh, then cladding, uh, furring strips, and uh, now our cladding can go over the wall strips, the roofing can go over the flat 2x4s, and we move on. Those flat 2x4s come out and then are essentially make the overhang for the building. Trim, again, here's our details with the insulation. The siding goes on, it's simply going over the top of the furring strips. Generally, we support self-support all of our porches and uh, entry roofs. This one is actually being hung off the structure. That's not normal or typical for us. We'd rather just run a post up on the backside and pin it to the building rather than hanging it from the building. Again, details, finishing. Another house using a similar approach, similar technique. Again, these are just to give you an idea of the sequence. Two layers, first horizontal, second's vertical, but this is a one-story house, so it's kind of moot in, uh, in that sense. But here you see the uh, house completed in, the windows cut, the membrane goes on, the insulation is placed, the furring strips put on, cladding, roofing, and now we're indoors. You'll see that a wide baseboard is used for all of our uh, electrical on the wall systems. Around the doors, the door jams typically are thicker, so we go with a thick, furred out uh, wall around the door, and that carries our electrical for uh, our switches at the door for interior and exterior lighting. Here again, you see this one is carried by the structure. Uh, we've moved now to more of a self freestanding approach for anything that's bigger than this. This works quite well at that size, but anything bigger, we go to a freestanding roof or deck. Again, some additional details, another look house with a pergola. Here's the interior wall finishes. You just use a knockdown finish. You can do a splatter coat, a spray finish, knock it down, paint it, the wall is complete. In this case, the floor is sanded and finished. It's also OSB, the, the same material. Um, somebody even got carried away and used it for a countertop, uh, used for floor treads, uh, or stair treads, I should say. Here again, you see the interior electrical. All right, so a recap here. Foundation's generally normal with exterior, obviously, water control, uh, air, vapor, and insulation. Floor deck's pretty similar, except it's held tight dimensions, so the wall system will slide down past it uh, to the sill plate. And uh, enclosure can be done in one to two days in terms of the roof of the structure, and we can have it dried in and secured in three to five days, including our window installation with primer, membrane, et cetera. And then you can move on to insulation, roofing. Uh, interior finishing and framing is mostly normal. And again, you can decide whether you want to use regular 2x4 framing inside with regular uh, electrical, etc. Or we also have used these panels for interior walls as well. So quick erection, fast to dry and secure, which is uh, very important for the building uh, industry today. Uh, our buildings are getting left out in the rain, so to speak, way too long. Uh, we can use a lower skilled labor set to do this extremely robust. 
Uh, its strength advantages are somewhat uncertain at this point, so we're still doing some testing to kind of move this towards code acceptance. Again, there are certain design limitations from an engineering perspective, and there are certain engineering costs that still must be uh, done to uh, get the system accepted, obviously, by local uh, code bodies. I'm going to skip this slide, but the point is the cost is still a little bit higher uh, than a standard house, but I think we are going to get down to something that's very, very similar to Energy Star uh, by the time we're done with the project. We've got three more houses that we're doing uh, this spring and summer. So final thoughts and notes. High performance homes will require new enclosure strategies similar to what we just talked about. Uh, we have to have higher insulation levels, as I mentioned. We need to improve our integrity of our water, air, and vapor control airs. Uh, we need better drying strategies when and if moisture susceptible materials get wet. Uh, and we need a more robust way to deliver the product. These high performance enclosures will also demand a very high performance approach to our mechanicals, something I haven't talked about, but I'd be negligent if I didn't mention, uh, you must now move into a very different approach for your low load HVAC and uh, your domestic hot water. Uh, we're talking about very tight, obviously, sealed combustion systems, uh, high attention to your ventilation approach, increased attention to indoor air quality, source control, et cetera and distribution of fresh air throughout the building. And you will need to integrate makeup air for any exhaust systems in the building. These buildings are coming in uh, less than 100 CFM at 50 uh, or, or slightly higher, but less than 200 in all cases. So these, these houses essentially, you got to use your, uh, you know, your uh, range hood as a blower door. Again, don't forget to partner up with folks that can help you. You don't have to do this on your own. Uh, take advantage of the energy raters, your performance consultants, the performance programs are out there, whether they be government programs, uh, utility programs, the public-private programs, uh, such as Green Home Institute uh, uh, supports and, and runs, LEED, for instance, and Green Star, other programs like that. Uh, again, this is just a reminder of the resources. I'm just going to flip through those quickly. You can go back and get them later. Uh, take advantage of the DOE resources especially the Building America Solutions Center, uh, BASC.energy.gov, and a new tool that's at your disposal is called the Building Science Advisor. It's been put together by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and this is an advisor where basically you can put in your building wall system and it'll give you advice. Uh, it'll actually show its moisture durability performance, poor, critical, iffy, and good and it will show its energy performance relative to uh, thermal performance, uh, relative to code, code compliance. So very powerful tool. Uh, it's out and available now. Uh, the new version will be coming shortly, but you can still use it and provide input and comments uh, to the uh, pr providers. As I said, as I mentioned, there is a resource list, some excellent readings. The moisture control guidance shown at the bottom here was where the pen test shows up, if you want to read more about the pen test. Uh, here's some more on the perfect wall and your guide to continuous insulation and basically how to fasten cladding through continuous insulation. It's not that challenging really. Uh, it just takes a little detail first time out, a little extra uh, supervision for your uh, trades. And then uh, there's a video available called Getting Enclosures Right in Zero Energy Ready Homes. Uh, very, very good uh, complement to, to what we covered today additional resources and locations. And finally, I'll put up my uh, contact information. I certainly welcome questions and comments that might have not been covered here or we might be able to cover in the question and answer session. Um, Follow-up email or phone calls uh, would be uh, certainly appropriate. So let's turn it back to see what else we might have on the question. Hey, Pat, yeah, thanks. And um, do you have some time to stick around for some questions? Absolutely. All right, perfect, yeah. Well, before we uh, get to those, um, let me just uh, real quick go over uh, a couple different things here. Um, let me take back the, there we go. Um, so we're gonna go over the uh, tie-in uh, real quick, just real briefly uh, to the uh, uh, Lead for Home certification program. Um, so hopefully that's up now. There we go. Uh, so yeah, this, um, you know, everything we talked about here today with the perfect wall and these strategies are more than enough to help meet 
the lead B, D, and C, uh, V4 homes, single family and multi-family program um, as far as your uh, water management um, and durability uh, management program uh, strategies. So uh, now this, this credit here covers a lot of different stuff uh, within the house. And so uh, it doesn't cover, the walls uh, do not cover everything we've been talking about here. Um, but mostly what we're focused on here is the Energy Star for Homes uh, Water Management Checklist Program, uh, which is required for LEED um, to be completed by the builder and signed off as a quality management program, something or something equivalent to it. And then also uh, the OSB that was referenced for flooring uh, actually would work out very well for water resistive flooring being installed um, within, a, within a LEED project. So here again, we're not going to go over all of this, but you can access this on uh, the Energy Star and Building America website and go through it in much more detail on their website. Um, so many of the aspects of the perfect wall foundation, uh, the wall assembly, of course, and the roof assembly uh, are more than met um, within trying to achieve uh, this water management program. It's just a baseline uh, for LEED for Homes uh, certification under the materials um, and resources uh, credit. Uh, and then as questions are coming in, how do you get your CEUs? If you're watching here live today, make sure to take that survey that pops up or is emailed. If you're watching the on-demand recording, make sure to take that quiz with an 80% passing rate. Uh, YouTube members use YouTube, USGBC, follow the USGBC instructions. For YouTube folks watching uh, here, make sure to go and click on that little YouTube link within the video. And then on the left there, follow down to the show more tab. And then on the right there, make sure to click the uh, CU link to access the quiz and follow the quiz submittal instructions. And then before we get to questions, just a huge thanks to all of our board of directors, our members, our volunteers, uh, and a big thanks to our top tier sponsor, Shrinergy, uh, for on the go or in your house, uh, backup solar powered uh, generation systems, T-Stud structurally insulated framing systems, uh, Mitsubishi Electric for low load, all electric um, heat pump uh, systems that work in very cold climates, and then Panasonic ventilation to help meet uh, all your ventilation needs, uh, no matter what you're working on. Big thanks to them. So yeah, we've got some uh, time for questions here. I do see a few there, and let me get this up. One of them was specifically about structurally insulated panels and uh, moisture control for those. Um, any Quick comments on that, Pat. Yeah, so the structural insulated panel is a, is a unique system. And if you kind of think it back through the perfect wall context, uh, they certainly uh, have been used in the marketplace successfully. So again, uh, it, it's, a, it's a technique that's available, but I just want to remind people that the structure in this case is both indoors and outdoors. So the real structural performance of this system is the two OSB layers uh, that are held together by the web, uh, the insulation material in, in the web, if you will. It's kind of an I-beam approach, if you want to think of it that way. And uh, that gives it a structure. So the point here is the outside panel sees the outdoors, the inside sees the indoors, and that can cause some stresses in, uh, in the system. And so just certainly be aware of that, be careful of that. Uh, obviously there are joinery uh, issues, and today's SIP uh, insulation uh, procedures are very, very clear about making absolutely certain that those seams are airtight both on the inside and outside. Uh, again, if you have a seam that's sealed on the outside, let's say where the water is just a barrier, et cetera, uh, air can still move into that panel joint from the indoors uh, and move out to the, a cold surface that uh, is, you, know, you don't want that exterior panel getting wet. So uh, those details are there to make sure the air control air is both inside, outside, and water control, if you will, outside, uh, vapor control, both outside, inside. I think it's just less robust, and so I, I clearly had mentioned in the one, if if I were doing that, I might go with a thin SIP and then apply the exterior controller strategies to the outside of the SIP. And now you have the SIP in its perfect location where it's always going to be nice, warm, and dry. Now I recognize there's financial implications of that. Uh, you're kind of buying two high, uh, you know, high-end systems, if you will. But again, I want people to think about the concept uh, more than the product. Um, and uh, before I get to this next question, I really appreciate you mentioning low load homes. We actually did a webinar on that uh, 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 last week, so maybe we did it out of order, um, but that is available on our website for all of those who have achieved uh, low load homes. Make sure to go check that out for the HVAC systems. 
Um, but the next question in that context is in the in the SPS system, is all the electrical run inside uh, the solid panel? Uh, so you try to keep everything to the interior as much as possible and then throughout walls as necessary. And then to follow up, you know, where is the duct work and what type of mechanicals do you put in a home like that? Excellent. Yes, we are running all the electrical inboard of the uh, solid panel system. Uh, so that's that wide baseboard. Essentially, it's just a, a uh, we, we even take the slices of the OSB in some cases and put that on the top and the bottom of the baseboard, then put on a stair skirt uh, and uh, install your electrical you know, on that channel and it'll come flush out with your stair, stair skirt uh, for a, a cover uh, plate. And then you can put a little piece of molding on the top and it's a quite, a, quite a handsome uh, baseboard. Uh, the, the electrical obviously is down lower than most people are uh, familiar with, but nonetheless, it's there and without in, you know interfering with the integrity of the structure or any of the control errors. And then we do fur out the the uh, doorways, the entry doorways, sliding doors, uh, just because of the desire to have electrical there. We'd rather keep that in a chase way uh, and not again interfere with the panels. So yeah, that's uh, uh, the uh, the low load is it, we're doing it with. Currently with uh, gas forced air systems, because that's what's prevalent here and what our contractors are comfortable with. We're having trouble getting small enough furnaces that will effectively work with these low loads. You know, we're down in the uh, less than 30,000, probably approaching closer to 25,000 BTU per hour design loads on the uh, heating side. And we're less than two ton, generally a ton and a half on the cooling side. So uh, yes, downsizing equipment. Uh, we're using smaller ductwork. We're still using traditional ductwork in uh, floor trusses and in our interior wall cavities where we're using studs on the interior. If we don't, we simply put up the panel wall. We put in some spacer blocks. We run our plumbing. We run our ductwork. We put in a second panel and it's essentially protected. If you ever needed to get to the plumbing or ductwork, you simply pop that panel and you have access to it. So. Um, it, you know, it's it, it's different, but yeah, it, it cer certainly can still be handled even with a solid panel interior wall. Um, and we're looking at new equipment. We're looking at the all electric uh, air source heat pump as an alternative. Uh, we're looking at a new uh, low load, uh, uh, smaller diameter duct system for gas forced air approach. So yeah, uh, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's no small challenge actually. There's probably people online that have tried these uh, high performing low load homes. Uh, it takes a little while to get your HVAC contractor over the over the hurdle. Um, what are the hydrothermal considerations in the uh, Opt Minnesota Opt MN uh, design with a semi-permeable um, WRB? Understanding ASHRAE 160 indicates a 1% moisture load on the WRB. Right. Yeah. So. <clears throat> We know you can move to per, more permeable or even permeable uh, water and air control errors. It makes it a little more challenging in terms of reducing your wetting potential. But again, if you're using materials outboard of that that are not uh, moisture susceptible, the outward wetting, if you will, is not going to be a problem as long as we've kept it and the material it's on, the sheathing it's on, uh, well above uh, you know the concern for ongoing or or long-term condensation. I mean, there, there may be a flash of condensation or some extreme event, but it, because the drying potential there, it can turn right around and, and dry off. Uh, and then likewise, on the outside coming in, we are going to have water on that surface. And so when we move into something other than the highly impermeable peel and stick and self-healing peel and stick membrane, because we want healing where the cladding uh, furring strip fasteners are moving through our air water vapor control layer. If we were to move to something that isn't healing, such as the uh, impregnated uh, sheathing materials, et cetera, um, or perhaps a lower perm barrier, then we want to provide drainage between the insulation and the air water vapor control layer, or water and air control layer if it's semi-permeable. Uh, and that will allow liquid drainage of any condensation or the 1% that gets back there uh, to safely be evacuated and reduce the uh, both the liquid water and vapor pressure on your higher perm, if you will, control air. Um, Doable, just a, just a little more complicated, that's all. Right. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on the ability to, uh, you know, use alternatives to any kind of foam on these walls? Is it, I mean, in going completely foam free, there's a, you know, discussion about that. There's interest in that. Is that, uh, I, I noticed you mentioned some alternatives. Is that, I mean, is that possible? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I yeah, I should have been careful about that. Uh, even on the optimum wall, uh, we, we use rigid insulation because it's a little more familiar with the you know, trades, if you will. Uh, it fe feels firmer when you're putting the furring strip on and fastening it back to the structure. But when I showed those resource lists, you know, there are lots of alternatives, including uh, basically uh, rigid fiberglass panels, uh, uh, wool, rock wool type panels, uh, even EPS, uh, graphite impregnated EPS panels can be used. So. Uh, you're wide open there. Uh, you know, spray foam could be used in the applications that I showed too. Uh, but yet, like I said, if you're concerned about quality control or issues related to spray foam, or you're concerned about global warming potential of some of the rigid board foams, uh, then you can move into the air and vapor permeable materials. You're probably going to be a little more careful about your venting and drying cavity behind your cladding. For instance, if I went to a, a more open, uh, let's say fibrous material, at that layer, I would probably be a little more careful about closing off the top of the cavity. There would still be vapor relief. There'd still be some, uh, obviously, liquid water relief. There'd still be some drying between the collaborates, if you will, but we wouldn't have active wind flow uh, in that channel that could work its way back into the uh, fibrous insulation pan panel, reducing its uh, effective thermal uh, performance. Um, I've heard some builders, you know, really just not like um, exterior insulation on the foundation walls at all, just because it could be uh, damaged. You know, someone digs it up, breaks it, pests, whatever. Um, any any thoughts on that, or have you seen anything to uh, show that that could be an issue? We do have concerns about exterior foam. Our market has moved that way pretty successfully. With, you know, a lot of fits and starts, a lot of fights from builders, et cetera. But once they got there and found out how much better that basement performs, because it has drying potential now, right? The foundation, if it's wet during construction or if it were to get wet due to a, you know, a minor leak or whatever, it, it just quickly and, and uh, harmlessly dries to the inside. The foundation walls are warm uh, and dry. Uh, it just, they quickly realized that a bunch of their headaches kind of went away. So. They worked harder at making it work, and there's techniques for you know covering the above grade portion. They do have to be a little more careful during construction that it doesn't get, you know, the top edges don't get broken up or, or damaged. Um, you, know, you can cut a piece, pull it out, put a new piece in. You know, it isn't that you can't repair it, but yeah, it, it does take a little bit of more care. And, and the pest concern is the primary one. We're kind of north of the termite zone for the most part still <laughs> today. That could change. Uh, and if you keep it nice and dry and there's good drainage, the carpet ants seem to be less of a concern. But yeah, that, I'd say the pest concern is still there. And so uh, certainly in markets where there, there are termites, you have to be concerned about a termite shield and treatment or, or baiting. So yeah, that, that's legitimate. You do need to worry about that. But for all the things we just talked about, interior insulation and foundations has all the challenges that I presented for the cavity wall, plus some, right? Because it only has one drying potential and that's inward. So below grade foundation insulation is incredibly difficult on the inside. It gets incredibly simple from a physics perspective on the outside, uh, but there are some practical installation issues that have to be addressed. Um, you know, there, there is still a lot of pushback against exterior rigid, um, especially once you get above half an inch. Um, you know, just genuinely, it doesn't seem like, uh, anecdotally speaking, anyway, from what we hear, um, the majority do not like using it. Any, any comments on that? Well, I, I would just say, yeah, I understand that. It, it, it is a transition for sure. I have builders, even zero energy ready home builders, who really resisted the exterior foam with with the furring strip. But the reality is. For instance, a two by six wall with R5, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of like not quite going where you want it to go. I mean, it's it's a, such a kind of incremental partial solution. 
it doesn't get you over the hurdle for having an interior air and vapor retarder. Uh, it does warm up the sheathing, so it's gonna be warmer than OSB. So yes, you gain some reduction in wetting potential. Uh, it, it still doesn't have great drying potential, obviously, to the outdoors. And because you can't remove the indoor uh, vapor control and air control, it doesn't dry the indoors. So you're adding a lot of complexity for the builder with some gains, but limited gains. So the trick here is how do you get them to go big enough, a couple inches, let's say, or three inches, to where now they've stepped into a whole different paradigm. The interior becomes entirely different. You know, No concerns about vapor retarders, air bears, sealed boxes, on and on and on. Uh, less concern about um, framing windows and having you know double framing or framing for to carry uh, uh, beams and headers you know with multiple studs you know a lot of these things that they're faced with today due to the types of designs they're doing just kind of slide back away and it's all protected or allowed if you will by the exterior foam so they just have to get over that hurdle and recognize you know what somebody's got to be smart enough to be able to take a long screw screw it through and hit the framing and uh, once somebody knows how to do that, it, it's it's really uh, no, no longer a challenge. And again, that's why I showed the references because the resources are there showing you uh, what the fastening schedule needs to be for the furring strip. Remember, remember now, the whole key of this, the next piece of this is the furring strip now is a structural member. So you're fastening the furring strip structurally, and now you can use any cladding, uh, not any weight, you gotta be a little careful with the weight and the tables will help you with that. You aren't gonna hang brick off of that. Um, you can hang fiber cement siding for instance, but uh, you, you basically now just, and the siding problem becomes simply a, you know, just a cosmetic thing. I mean, just you know, put up your siding, anybody can do it. The storm comes, it damages the siding, you peel it off, you put it back, no big deal. You know, the insulation still protected, the water control, air control air is still protected. But, but again, I understand it's a hurdle, right? And builders like to work in incrementally, and that's why I included the extended wall plate uh, wall, because that's a transitional wall that they will recognize and can embrace and still get the benefits of almost continuous exterior insulation. Great. Well, hey, um, Pat, I really appreciate your time and University of Minnesota for having you out and Building America to, to talk about all this. I, uh, this is great, great conversation. Um, I guess just real quick, where can people go to contact you or go online to find out more information? And then also, um, I'm really excited about the uh, study that comes out on the SPS. And so when can we expect to see some more uh, some more detail about that? Yeah, is is this back on me by chance? Uh, I can uh, I can kick it uh, back over to you here. Just a just a second here. I'm gonna just quick throw up a site. Um, there you go. I have to show screen. Did it come up? Yep. So here's our site, Department of Bioproducts, Biosystem Engineering. And if we go into our research, building systems and uh, simply come down there and right there at the bottom will be the Northern Star Building America Partnership. I should have probably put that link in. Uh, if we get into that, then you can go and learn more about our partnership and building system. There are videos, studless wall research. You could probably search Northern Star studless wall and it'll probably bring you right here. I haven't tried it. And then you can watch panel installation and training videos. You can wow. see some of the project summary and goals. And uh, our project was to wrap up June 30th. We're asking for an extension. So our final report won't be out uh, until mm -hmm. early next year. But yeah. uh, we certainly, you're, you're, all of this is accessible. It's an open source system. Uh, you can have my other contact information by email or phone, or uh, certainly uh, go to this website and uh, follow up with questions. Great. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Pat, and take care, everyone. Bye. You bet. Thank you.